Hello. Um, in this recording, I wish to go over some examples that um, that you know similar to what we did in class, but uh, different uh, questions, especially those that might be difficult for you. Um, so I hope that when you are watching this, you have paper pencil with you and pause and rewind um, as needed. And let's begin. The first question, um, and of course I'm gonna choose some, uh, um, uh, we did a question number 44 in class uh, for the homework this week, week number 13. And uh, so I'm going to work on this Frig function, you know, these function that involve Frig uh, functions. And this happens to be number 47. And uh, so the function goes like this. Okay, so f of theta is equal to two times cosine theta plus cosine square theta. Okay, and we are given an interval. We're actually given an interval. The interval is from zero to two pi. Okay, and our task is of course is to find the intervals on which the function is increasing or decreasing and find the local max and local min and find the interval of concavity and inflection points. And of course, lastly, we're gonna sketch the curve. So with that function, right, we are going to, and obviously the extreme value theorem apply because this is a continuous function on a closed interval. So we have absolute max, absolute min, and absolute max and absolute min are local max and a local min. And uh, so just to make sure we, we know that, right? And uh, also we want to find, the, because these questions only ask for local max, local min, right? So we, but because absolute max, absolute, absolute min are also local max, local men, therefore we are going to have to find them. Okay, so I, I hope you hear that logic. But first let's find the interval on which the function is increasing or decreasing. According to the increasing decreasing test and, and the function involved are differentiable, so we can find the derivative. So the first we're gonna find derivative with respect to theta, okay? So if you like to write in the other notation, this is gonna be derivative with respect to theta. Okay, so that's how you can write it in the other notation if you wish. Um, you can just write either one, you don't have to write both. Taking derivative, okay. And the derivative of two times cosine theta, that's gonna be negative two sine theta because the derivative of cosine theta is negative sine theta. And uh, cosine th square theta, this is what we're gonna use chain rule. So it's a two times cosine theta, multiply the derivative of cosine theta, which is gonna be negative sine theta, okay? And then of course we would like to to write it in factor form. Simplify this form. And there's a negative sign here. So the negative sign will move here, right? And uh, like that, we could factor out the negative two. Okay, and what else can be factored out? We can factor out the sine theta. So negative two sine theta can be factored out. So negative two sine theta negative two sine theta can be factored out. If we factor those out, right? 
negative two sine theta is being factored out, and we will get one plus cosine theta. Okay, double check that we should be able to go back. Okay, negative two sine theta times one, negative two sine theta times cosine theta. So we are able to go back. That it, well, there's no point of, uh, you know, the domain for the function are all real numbers and we're limited on this interval and the functions are differentiable as many times as we want. And the, the derivative function is also dif differentiable everywhere. So we don't have any, uh, in term we don't have any point where the function is not differentiable, therefore, we will not have that category of, if you look at the uh, critical number, right? The definition of critical number, um, I have this on the, did I share that? Wait, yeah, okay. So the definition of a critical number, which is right here, in the category where the function you know, the, the derivative does not exist and the, the number is in the domain of the function, that kind of number doesn't exist. So all of our critical numbers are going to be the kind of numbers where the derivative is zero by format zero, uh, by definition, by format, by, by definition. And of course, those numbers will be candidates for local max, local min. Okay, and just, just to remind you that we work in this interval. So now we set it equal to zero, and we understand why we set it equal to zero because we're looking for candidates, right? Where local max, local min can be found. We set it equal to zero. If, if the derivative is set to be equal to zero, right? Then this product is gonna be zero. Right, negative two will never be zero. So we ended up solving this equation. And on this equation, of course, we can see this as a product of sine theta and another quantity. So we apply principle number five. So we get sine theta equals to zero. Or, one plus cosine theta is equal to zero. And what number will make sine theta equal to zero that are in the interval between zero to two pi, right? So from the first equation that we know that theta would equal to zero, right? Pi, sine pi is zero and two pi. And the zero and two pi are on the endpoints, right? So we get three solutions for sine theta. And the other one, one plus cosine theta equals to zero. So that means the cosine theta has to equal to, cosine theta has to equal to negative one. So what angle, so what is theta will cause cosine theta equals one, where theta is in zero to two pi, that number is going to be pi. Sine pi is negative one. Are there other numbers that equals to that, equals negative one? No, okay. So we found the critical numbers. Okay, so critical numbers are, theta equals to zero pi, two pi. Okay. And two of them are at the end points. So two of them are at the end points. Okay. So let's look at the increasing decreasing interval. So we found the critical numbers before we determine the local max, local min, Right, so let's look at the interval of increasing and decreasing. And we know that sine theta 
right? So we're going to study the sign of sine theta. Do we know the sign of sine theta? Well, sine theta is positive in the first quadrant, positive in the second quadrant, negative in the third quadrant, and negative in the fourth quadrant, right? So we look at the interval between zero to pi. So on this number line, you can use the sine curve as a reference. Okay, all of us, I assume, are pretty familiar with sine curve. Okay, so let me bring sine curve for our reference. Sine theta. Okay, and this curve, of course, is, is drawn by the software, but we only want to look at the interval between zero to two pi. Right, zero to two pi. Two pi is about 6.3. Wait, 6.3, here is just a zero. Okay, so that's sine theta. So from sine theta, you can tell, you can tell, what can we tell? From zero to pi positive, first quadrant, second quadrant third quadrant, fourth quadrant, right? So that tell us the positive. So we're gonna mark, so this point is zero, and uh, that point is pi over, two, pi over two. The reason we want to make it four quadrant is because there is a possibility, because the cosine is positive, negative, negative, positive. So that's why we're gonna make a little distinction in the four quadrant instead of just, just the quadrant one, two together, right? So I'm gonna, we can remove that. So this is the quadrant thing. You can line it up, you can line up, right? So, oh, wait, second. So this should be three pi over two, sorry. Three pi over two, three pi over two, and of course, we have the fourth quadrant, two pi. Okay, zero to pi over two, pi over two is a pi, that's the first second, third or fourth, right? So if we stretch the curve just to a comparable length, right? So they have a, they have a correspondence. There's a correspondence, right? So pi, this is zero, and this is one. So you understand that, okay? So in terms of sine of sine theta, right? So here we're going to mark the, the sine. In the first quadrant is positive. Okay, so let me remove that. That's positive. Okay, second quadrant. So all of these are positive. At a pi, of course, that's a zero. And all of these are negative. And of course here is a zero, okay? So if you need to pause to review your trigonometry, feel free to do that, feel free to do that. So we know the, si the sign of sine theta. How about the sign of one plus cosine theta, right? We're looking at this product, the sign of this product, right? The sign of the product negative two is negative and the sine theta have different sign, but how about one plus cosine theta? So cosine theta has, has a range between negative one to positive one. From this, okay, this is true for any real number in the domain, okay? For any theta. And of course, for theta between zero and two pi, this is still true. As a consequence, uh, we know that one plus cosine theta is going to be at least zero, right? All you have to do is just look at this part of the inequality, right? 
and you add one on both sides and you have that. So this piece is either positive. So when you look at the sign of this piece, right? One plus, so now we can, we're gonna bring this with us, okay? So bring that with us and determine the sign, okay? So this piece, we know the sign of sine theta. Now, when we look at the sign, I'm gonna put it here, okay? The sign, the sign of the first order derivative. I'm gonna put it here. I'm gonna use the same number line, okay? And we know that in the first quadrant, the sign is positive. Positive times negative times another positive, right? So this piece is this piece, the sign of the first order derivative, that's gonna be what? That's gonna be negative. So in this interval is gonna be decreasing. In the second interval, right? Sine theta is still positive. So this is positive times negative. That's gonna be negative times another positive is gonna be negative again. Okay, and of course here is a zero. And on the third quadrant and the fourth quadrant, sine theta is what? Isn't, it was negative, so sine theta alone. And this is a negative, negative times negative is positive. So this is a positive, time positive times positive is positive. So this is Jesus like that. Okay, so the sign of the first order derivative can be determined this way. So in terms of increasing, decreasing, what can we say? Right, what can we say? So these analysis, so see what are the information have we used here? We use, you know, the sine of one plus cosine theta, that's gonna be always a positive. Negative two is positive, sine theta has sine changes in different quadrants so we have used all of the information. So after all of these information are being used, now we can say, okay, f of theta, Okay, is decreasing on the interval from zero to pi, zero to pi, right? Because the derivative is negative. And what else? F of theta is increasing, increasing on the interval from pi to two pi. That's it. Okay, because we we only need to work this out on the on the on these two intervals. Do we need to show these work? Not necessarily. You can just use it. You can just use it. Okay, so I can put these on the the note for your reference. You don't need to show you know these works. Um, so that's the uh, interval of increasing, decreasing in sound. And then local max, local min, local max, local min. And this part gets interesting. This part gets interesting because we have one critical number in between. Uh, we have two other numbers that are the endpoints, right? So because the, the derivative is decreasing and increasing, so pi, at pi, f has a local minimum, has a local minimum. So we're gonna use first derivative test, okay? So apply first derivative test. What's first derivative test? First derivative test right here, right? So you have your flush card here and I have it right here. Okay, that's the first derivative test. Let's make it a little bit larger so you can see everything, okay? First derivative test. 
If you like to do second derivative class, so go ahead. Okay, it can be fun. You just have to find second order derivative, and we can do that uh, as an alternative. Okay, in a minute. The reason we use first derivative test because we already have the sign of uh, of the you know of the derivative first order derivative, right? So first of all, we know that the derivative of the function at pi is equal to zero. Okay, and uh, did I do it right? Wait, f prime. Okay, and what is more. The derivative changes from, from negative to positive, from negative to positive at pi, from negative to positive at pi, at pi. And therefore, According to first derivative test, from negative to positive, we have a local minimum. So F has local minimum at pi. And what is the value of local minimum? Okay, the value of the local minimum is going to be. We're gonna go back to the original function, okay? The original function is this piece. This piece evaluated at pi. So theta is replaced by pi and then both theta replaced by pi. Cosine pi is negative one. So this piece, we have two times negative one, plus cosine pi squared, that's gonna be negative one squared. So in the end, our local minimum is equal to negative one. Okay, so that's our local minimum. So let's look at the endpoints. Let's look at the endpoints, okay? On this interval, the function is going, is going downward, right? Decreasing, so at a zero, right? F has a local maximum, okay? So F has local max at zero, okay? Which is F of zero and we plug in zero on the original function and cosine square, and cosine zero equals to one, right? Cosine zero equals to one. So this is a two times one plus one squared. Okay, so this local max is going to be three, local max. How about at a two pi, at a two pi? From pi to two pi, the function is increasing, right? It's increasing. So increasing means it's going up, 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 up. So at two pi is a local max as well. It's F is a local max as well, right? Absolute max is local max, right? So local max at two pi, at two pi, right? And what is f of two pi? f of two pi is going to be plugging the number, wait, okay, so we plug in the number, right? And replace f, we replace theta by two pi, wait, and this is two pi. And what do we get? Cosine two pi is, is one. So this is two times one plus cosine squared two pi, that's gonna be a three as well. So in the end, we got these local max. How many local maxes we have? We have two local maxes, one local minimum, which is in the middle. Okay, 
The third question, we're going to find the interval of concavity and inflection points. You know, at this point, we might be just using second order to second derivative test to, um, to test drive. To test drive, you can, you can do that if you want to try it, right? And uh, but we need to find second, second derivative test. Okay, we need to do the second derivative test. Find the interval of concavity. So we need to find the first, uh, we need to find the derivative of the first order derivative. So we have a derivative here, which is right here, right? F of the first derivative is equals to this piece. And which one we're gonna use to find second derivative? You know what? I'm going to use this piece. Okay, so we're, we're going to work on this C. Okay, we have the first derivative. Our goal is to find second order derivative. Second order derivative. Okay, we remove those so they're not distractions. Before I find a second order derivative, I'm going to use some, uh, I'm going to simplify this function, which is going to be negative two sine theta minus two times sine theta cosine theta, that equals to sine two theta, that's a double angle. If I use double angle, then you, I don't need to use a product rule. You can go ahead and use a product rule, right? But I think this might be easier for me. So I'm gonna take a derivative, right? The derivative of a negative two sine theta, that's gonna be negative two cosine theta. Minus sine two theta, that's we're gonna use the chain rules is a cosine two theta. Multiply the derivative of two theta is two, so two times. So that's my second order derivative. Once my second order derivative is found, remember we need to find, uh, we need to work on the concavity, right? So what do we know about concavity? Second order derivative tell us about concavity, right? So we need to know the sign of second order derivative. So I need to write this in factored form. I need to write this in factored form. So let's see what I can do. I'm going to factor it out in negative two, cosine theta. Uh, no, I cannot factor out cosine theta, by the way, right? But I need to write it in factor form. How do I write this in factor form? I can pull out the, the negative two, right? But what can we do? This is what we can do. Okay, we're gonna use double angle. Okay, so where to use a double angle formula, right? Right here, I'm gonna write it down here in case you guys have any questions. Double angle, double angle sine, wait. Sine two theta or two what equals to two times sine theta, cosine theta. Okay, the formula you, you know maybe x, Okay, if that's, that's what you remember, it doesn't matter, double angle. Cosine double angle, right? Uh, it's double angle two times X equals to the three formula. And one of them is being cosine square, say, square X minus one. And we're gonna use this one, we're gonna use this one, okay? We're gonna use this one to replace cosine two theta. So cosine two theta is going to equal to two times theta equals to two times cosine squared theta minus one. So that piece will be substituted. So we're not in a rush. So we're gonna put these, we're you know, not changing this, subtracting two times Right, cosine two theta replaced by its equal. So we're gonna replace that by it. You can use parentheses if you want, okay? Now, 
and we actually get a quadratic function, okay? Opened up the parentheses, opened up the parentheses. So two times negative, negative two times two, that's negative four, cosine squared theta. And a negative two times negative one, that's plus two. Okay, so now I want you to see that this is a quadratic function, right? Why is a quadratic function? I'm going to arrange this by decreasing order. Okay. There, plus two, right? You see that's a square. If you imagine, if you, in your mind, you think of u as cosine theta, then you get a negative four u squared minus two u plus two, right? So we can do this explicitly or implicitly. So we, our second order derivative ended up to be like this. And of course, we still want to factor this. We, we still have want to have a factored form because from the factored form, we can tell we can tell about the concavity, right? So our goal is to tell the concavity. We want to tell the sign of second order derivative. We're gonna turn that into product. Before we turn that into product, we're gonna factor out a negative two, okay? After we factor out the negative two, we have two times cosine squared theta. Okay, plus cosine theta minus one. Did I get that right? So let's double check. Negative two times that, that's gonna be negative four of those. Negative two times positive cosine theta is negative two times cosine theta. Ne negative two times negative one is positive two. So we got it. Factoring, you can factor this explicitly or implicitly and use your, use your, um, you know, use your scratch paper, right? So on your scratch paper, on your scratch paper, right? So I'm going to have this function factored, right? And this function, I would see it as um, two times u squared, you can use x if you want to, plus u minus one. How is this factored? Actually, this can be factored, right? Um, I'm quickly doing this and I, I'm going to just do it for the sake of doing it. And you can do any way you want, quadratic formula, any way you want to, to factor this, right? So I got, I got, if you have questions about factoring, we can talk about it in another, in another uh, video, in another recording, if it's just two times u minus one, right? I check it, two u squared minus two u, uh, plus two u minus u minus one, it works, it works. Because my u is cosine theta. So here I got this form. I'm going to put it right here. And I'm going to bring my u here. You can do this part as long as it's well organized and everything is clear. Okay. I don't need to see how exactly you factor it as long as the factors are correct. Okay. Because I will verify it. So we will get the product of three numbers the product of a three quantity, negative two, and this, this, this piece and that piece. So finally, we get the second order derivative found there. Now we can tell the sign. How do we tell the sign? From our previous work, we know that one plus cosine theta is always positive, right? So I'm gonna kind of put it next to this piece. It's always a positive. So what about the sign of uh, two times cosine theta minus one? Okay, two times theta minus one. Well, 
that it could change sign, right? But remember, we're gonna set the second order derivative equal to zero. We first have to identify where the sign change takes place, right? Where the sign changes takes place. All right, so we're gonna set second derivative equals to zero. Set it equals to zero. Well, when we set it equals to zero, well, negative two cannot be zero. So two times two plus cosine theta minus one is zero by, by um, or cosine theta plus one could be zero, right? Zero product property, principle number five. We set it equal to zero, right? We set it equal to zero. You can write down the equation if you want. Okay. Now, solving these equations, solving these equations from this piece, what do we get? We get a cosine theta equals to half. Or, okay, we, we, we're doing this parallelly in a uh, cosine theta equals to negative one. Okay. Now, what are the solutions for cosine theta equals to half? The solution is in the interval between zero to pi, one full circle. What are those values? Well, the terminal, because the cosine theta is half, right? Um, you can apply unit circle, right? You can apply unit circle. Um, let's see, I'm gonna find a unit circle because I, I have it. Okay, so I'm gonna find a unit circle and bring it to you. Well, you just use simply use a definition, but the angle is going to be in the first quadrant or the fourth quadrant because the cosine is positive in the first quadrant and the fourth quadrant. Okay, so now I'm going to uh, find a unit circle for us to illustrate. Okay, hold on, I have it. I'm going to copy that. Okay, I'm copying and paste. Whoops, it doesn't allow me to copy and paste, wait. You guys probably could find a unit circle, right? Just so... Hold on a second, I'm gonna find that unit circle for you. So by this time you already have the solution probably, right? Cosine, what number equals to one half? Pi over three, right? Pi over three. So theta, theta equals to, Pi over three, okay, or five pi over three. So we have two, I cannot copy that, uh, but I'm gonna use a screenshot. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna copy a screenshot. I should get it now. There. That's the unit circle. Okay, you can find it anywhere. Okay, some of you probably has a good, very good memory. You're gonna use it, right? You can use the unit circle. You can see the red number is a cosine value. Cosine theta equals to half. The terminal is pi over three. Remember, the solution has to be um, in the interval of our discussion. And the other one is five pi over three. Okay. 
uh, why don't why don't we use negative pi over three? Well, negative pi over three is not in the interval. Okay, so phi pi over three should just choose just two solutions. Okay, so that's what we found from here, right? And next is what do we get for cosine theta? How cosine theta equals to negative one? What what angle that will cause cosine theta equals to negative one? Or well, that angle is negative. Uh, the angle is pi, right? We did we just did that in the interval, right? Pi. All right. So we got three numbers. Okay, we got three numbers that could cause this product equals to zero. They are candidates for inflection point. They are candidates for inflection points. Okay, so what do we do? On the interval, so we still have to look at the sign, right? Look at the sign. So from zero to two pi, right? From zero to two pi, what are the intervals that we need to well, we need to stop at pi over three, right? And uh, continue. The next number is phi pi over three, because now we're observing the sign of the second order derivative. And then it's two pi. Oh, there's a pi in between, right? There's a pi here. There's a pi and there's a two pi. Two pi, of course, the endpoints, right? So we look at the sign of these functions. Wait. Okay, I just, well, this is a, the proportion may not be proper, but it, you know the intervals, right? So now we want to look at the sign. We look at the sign. Okay, we might need to we need we might need the the interval. We might need to use the uh, the unit circle. Okay, so we want to observe the sign of second order derivative. Whoops, sorry. Okay, we want to know the sign of second order derivative. And they're being factored. They're being factored. Okay. So between zero to pi over three, between zero to pi over three, between zero to pi over three, cosine theta, okay, you have to look at cosine theta is from one. Okay. So look at this interval. So let me make it clear for you. Okay, two times cosine theta, right? So when the angle is from zero to pi over three, zero to pi over three, how is how are those angle measured? Those angles are measured counterclockwise. So any one of these angles, okay, and. Uh, the ratio, the red number, look at the red number, those are the cosine values, right? And those numbers, there are many of them, there are infinitely many of them from one, they're, they're decreasing. The smallest one is half. So when we plug in all of these numbers from one to half, and then, okay, when we plug in all of one of these numbers, okay, one, you know, cosine theta. So, so this product, but I mean, uh, this is difference. Two times cosine theta, that is going to be positive. So this piece is positive. Okay, one angle is from zero to pi. So this piece is a positive. This piece is a positive. That is a positive multiply a negative. So on this interval from zero to pi over three is going to be negative, okay? If you need to pause this, please do that. 
that. So what you what you pause to do, right? What you do is that you plug in these numbers. So you plug in one, you, you plug in say from zero, right? You, you plug in zero to pi over three. And you just try a test point, say pi over four. You plug in pi over four, you plug in this to see if you get a, uh, to see if this is a positive or negative. So this is a positive. And this is positive, positive times negative. So that's that's why we get the negative. Okay. Continue, you may like to pause. And for, then for between pi over three to pi, we're going to assess, of course, still this piece, whether it's positive or negative, right? So now we have known that this is concave down, right? For between pi over three to pi, the angles are going to be measured. <clears throat> They're all measured from center position, but it's a, the, the, the angles of our interest is from pi over three to pi. Okay, on this interval, the the red number, if you look at the red number, okay, the red number are half, negative half, negative root two over two. These are just uh, some examples. You pick up any one of these red numbers and plug in two times cosine theta minus one, and you want to observe the sign of this product. So when I pick negative half and I plug in cosine theta, that's gonna give me a negative number. So on this interval, on this interval from pi over three to pi, this is a negative. And this is a negative. What I mean is that, oops, this piece is a negative yeah, on this interval. Negative times negative, that's gonna be positive. And we, because we know this is a positive. Okay, so this is how we do it piece by piece. From pi to pi pi over uh, five pi over three. <clears throat> From pi to pi pi over three, the idea is the same. Okay, so we're gonna measure angles to still from the standard position. Remember I we reviewed ARD, right? So from pi, we're gonna look at these angles from pi to phi pi over three over here. Okay, pi to phi pi over three. Okay, then you look at the numbers. You look at the red number from negative one, negative root three over two, negative root two over two, negative half, zero, and you, you plug in one of these numbers to replace the cosine theta, what do we get? we're gonna get negative, right? So once again, once again, on this interval, on this interval, this piece is negative, negative again. Negative times negative is positive. So on this interval, it's positive, right? Okay, positive. So concave up, concave up, there's no change of concavity. So this tells us that pi is not an inflection point, okay? Even though the second order derivative is zero. Okay. Okay, so now the last but not least from five pi to two pi. So these are the angles that measure, of course, from standard position, but from phi pi to two pi. So these are the angles of our interest. So these angles are of our interest. Okay, these angles. For these angles, and you look at the numbers, it's uh, root two over two, root three over two, one, right? So you pick a, either one of these numbers, you plug in here, and that will cause 
two times cosine theta to be positive, right? And uh, the two times cosine theta minus one to be positive. So this is a positive. Positive times negative is negative, and this is a positive. So on this piece, it's negative. So now at least you know that trig trig trigonometry logarithm, you know, they do have applications in, in, um, in calculus. Okay, so now we know concavities, right? So what do we say? How, what, how do we put the, uh, the narratives together about the concavity? All right? In the, on, on this e interval is a concave up, a oh, concave down, sorry. This is a concave down. Concave down. Okay. On this interval is a concave up. And uh, and in fact, the whole of it is a concave up. Concave up. Right? And the next one is a concave down. Okay, so let's see if we can uh, write them down in words. Let's write them down in words. Okay, question C, we're gonna describe the concavity, find the interval of concavity and then inflection point, right? So we're gonna describe the concavity. F is concave, Concave down on the interval between zero to pi over three. And that interval phi pi over three to two pi. Okay. F is concave up on um, the whole of the interval from three pi, uh, pi over three, all the way to five pi over three. Okay, so conductivity test, inflection point, inflection point. Inflection point by definition, a inflection point is where the point changes from concave up to concave down or from concave down to concave up, right? So if we look at the definition, we understand we have a change of concavity at pi over three. Okay, so we have a change of concavity at pi over three. At this point, we have a change of concave down to concave up. And at pi, even though it is second or derivative is zero, but it is, there's no change of concavity. So pi is not an inflection point. Phi pi over three, there's a change of concavity from concave up to concave down. So now we can say, okay, so let's, we have two of them, right? So what, what are we gonna say? We say second derivative, right? Changes from negative to positive okay. Left to right. at pi over three. Okay, so we have, a, we have an inflection point. Inflection point, 
So we need to evaluate f of pi over three. And so we're going to go back to the original function to evaluate that. And the original function f, what is it? Right here. Right, we're going to evaluate it at pi over three. Right, at pi over three. So we change the line. So pi over three is plugged in cosine theta to replace theta. And we know that cosine, cosine pi over three is half, right? So this is two times half. Plus, okay, the other one is half squared, right? So half squared. And what do we get in the end? One, a two times half is one. One plus a quarter is, is a five-fourths. Five fourths. So one inflection point. That inflection point is pi over three, comma, f of pi over three. So it's a point. And that point, of course, in our case is pi over three comma, five quarters, five quarters. And we have another inflection point, okay? You can mention pi is not inflection point, okay? Um, we're gonna mention that later. So F this time, right? Where does it change? It changes from positive to negative left to right at a five pi over three, right? So we're gonna evaluate F of five pi over three. I'm taking this, I'm just taking some shortcuts, okay? So five pi over three, so five pi over three, that's five pi over three. Cosine five pi over three is half as well, right? So this is gonna be half, and this is gonna be the same thing. So we're gonna get, uh, two times half, so it's actually the same value. Okay, and it's also equals to five quarters. Okay, so we get another inflection point. So this is the description of the inflection point, and this is a five pi over three. So five pi, pi over three. Okay, so now we're gonna put things together and do the graph and do the graph of the function. Okay, because we're gonna see a lot more details, we're gonna see a lot more details. Okay, so when we have, when we do the graph, of course, we know the function is right here. We can easily just, uh, so D sketch. When we try to sketch, what do we try to find out, right? We got local max, local min. So we're gonna put those local max, local min together. So what are the local max, local min? We have local max at zero, Right? So we have a local min here. So local min. So we have local min. Local min is pi, f of pi, right? f of pi is negative one. And local max, we have this, this is a point on the curve, right? And there's another point. The other point is zero f of zero, zero, three. And another local max is going to be two pi, 
straight. Okay, so we're gonna, I'm going to bring these points together. I'm going to bring these two, these points together, local min, local max, and then we bring those to the picture. As a matter of fact, I'm going to do this. Um, I'm going to do the picture right here. Okay, so I'm going to start the, 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 the graphing tool and the, the interval of our interest. Right, the interval of our interest is from zero to two pi. Okay, so that's a 6.3 approximately, right? So that's a zero to two pi. So I activated this, uh, you know, this rectangular system. I'm gonna put things together. Um, let's see, making some adjustment, right? I'm not putting the, the the graph there yet. Okay, so we, we know there's a local local min. Okay, so there's a local minimum. Local minimum, I'm gonna use the color green. Okay, so local minimum right there. And these two are local maximum. So we have two local maximum. One, so red, another, red, we have two local maximum. It's out of the range, so we're gonna have to increase the view to be like that. Okay, as you can see, local max, local min, color, right? Uh, so this, these are the, the local max, local min. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this picture to put in the inflection points in place. Okay, so I'm taking this picture, I'm moving downward, right? We put the picture here. We got an inflection point. We have two inflection points. And these two inflection points I'm going to use the color purple. Purple, one of them, right? There's an inflection point and there's another inflection point. Purple. Maybe I should use blue. Why? I'm going to use blue because purple and red may look similar to you. Okay, so I'm going to use blue. Okay. All right, so the two local maximum, which are the endpoints of the interval, one local minimum, and these are the inflection point. Okay, so now let's put the graph together. Inflection points are where the function is, in a, is going to uh, connect it, right? It's gonna pass those points. And so all of these points should be on the curve. Okay, all of these fun points should be on the curve. So I'm connecting these points, look, right there, right? Local max, local max. Local min, inflection point. There's a con this piece is a concave down, and this piece is a concave up. You see, from from this piece is a concave up, concave up, concave down. So inflection points. So finally, I'm going to put a summary on this picture. Okay, so this is a local max. Okay, and that piece is local max. And this, this piece is inflection point. So that's blue, inflection point. 
Okay, and that one is inflection point as well. Point. And that piece, which we're going to use a green, that's the local minimum. Local minimum. Okay. And uh, you can, um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate. Wait. Okay. Sorry. So these are the marking of these points. And local max, of course, you know the value here. You can you know go back to figure out it better yet if you can mark it by by the by the numbers okay by the numbers and here actually i would try to do that okay so i can i can give you a better uh, show of this work okay so inflection point this piece i'm going to put it here okay there's another inflection point right there. Okay. It's just like, you know, the, the software doesn't allow me to write it down properly. So that's the inflection point. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna use arrow to point it for you. Local min, right? We have a local min, local max. So where's the local min, local max? We have these points, right? So I'm putting these points in place. Uh, let's see if I can make this happen. Wait. There. No. We have to readjust. I think that's all. Oh, we, that's all the points we need. Okay, so I'm going to redo this. So this high, oh, this is a local minimum. Okay, so I'm going to put it here, right? And uh, this point goes there. And that point goes there. Okay, so finally, I'm kind of combining two softwares to illustrate this, right? And this is the local, local min. And this is the local max. Okay, and that is the local max. And this is the inflection point. Blue inflection point. And that is an inflection point. I'm showing you this because I expect you to mark them correctly. Okay, so local max. That's the marking, local max. Ideally, you write this point right next to the point, okay? But it's a little hard for me to do using this software. And local min, right, like this. Inflection point, inflection point. In the ideal world, if you write it by hand or you have paper, you can maneuver this. You put this point right next to the blue. You put this point right next to the blue. You put this point right next to the points. Okay, that would be perfect. All right, so that's the end of this question. And I think it takes quite a lot of time because I explained it. If you, if you have to write it down, it wouldn't have taken so much time. Okay, so you can see how much trigonometry is needed to work these questions out, okay? Anyway, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask me. Thank you for watching.